Up until now, we've only discussed counterpoint for voices. But starting at the Baroque period, composers began to write counterpoint for instruments, and in ways not clearly derived from vocal writing. Although most instruments can play vocal lines fairly easily, the opposite is not true. Here is the subject from Bach's B minor Refugue, uh, the Well-Tempered Clavier, first book. While it's not impossible to sing this line, the constant leaps are certainly awkward for voices. But there's another aspect of this theme which makes it even harder. Starting in the second half of the first bar, the first eighth note of each pair is dissonant. The fact that the line leaps after the second note strongly suggests that it's the real chord tone. For voices to attack a dissonance, coming from another note by leap is much harder than just leaping between chord tones. However, on a keyboard instrument, playing these dissonances is not difficult. Notice that the leaps aren't arbitrarily arranged. In fact, we could split the line into two layers, lower and higher. Here's how this looks. I've written the theme as though it were divided between two parts. This kind of consistent leaping between two or more levels in a melodic line is called compound line. Notice that, within its own level, each line is actually mainly conjunct. Compound line is often found in instrumental writing, since leaps are so much easier for instruments than they are for voices. In fact, by the time Bach was mature, compound lines had even gone in the other direction and appear more and more frequently in vocal writing, but that doesn't mean that they're easy to sing. Because compound lines are constantly leaping, they often cover a fairly wide range. Here too, instruments offer advantages. Instrumental ranges are usually much larger than vocal ranges. Although the general principles of organizing a good line still hold, for example, the line overall often progresses gradually toward a climax, large leaps need to be recovered, and so forth, the sheer size and frequency of the leaps are often much greater than in vocal music. Note that the leaps generally use coherent motives for coherence. It's unusual to have multiple compound lines at the same time in different voices. Usually there'll be one or two compound lines and the others will be simpler, more vocal in style. There are two other things that are common in instrumental counterpoint, but vocally impractical or even impossible. Greater speed and greater variety of articulation. Here's the theme from Bach's D major fugue from the Well-Tempered Clavier, book one. The quick 30-second note figure would be ridiculous for voices, but on the keyboard it's not particularly hard. Here's another example that we first heard a few lessons ago for voices. Now it's for strings, and with the motives more clearly set apart by different articulations. Despite the overall homogeneous sound of the strings, the individual parts are much more easily distinguishable. Of course, instrumental counterpoint must respect the registers and idiomatic technique of each instrument. How to proceed when writing instrumental counterpoint that is not just vocal in style? First, always clearly establish the harmonic framework before working out the melodic details. This is especially important when dealing with leaping dissonances like appoggiaturas. Second, aim for motivic coherence, especially in the way accented dissonances are used. Motives are also often characterized by specific patterns of articulation, as we saw above. Three, have a general idea where the line will peak and roughly how to reach the peak. Here's a sample exercise for piano. We want to complete the given opening. This is in two-part counterpoint. Compound line is particularly suitable for two-part writing since it makes the texture much richer, in effect implying a third line.
This exercise is particularly difficult since it uses motives with various accented dissonances. The fact that it's only in two parts means that the compound line to be completed will cover a fairly wide range. Here's a harmonic sketch to see what the possible harmonies are and to find the chord tones available for the melody. Once this is done, the melodic line can be worked out, bearing in mind the overall shape, gradually rising toward what is clearly the climax in measure 9. It's important to look for opportunities for suspensions and appoggiaturas in connection with the given motives. Note that this is not a melodic outline, just a preparatory harmonization. Once again, unless the student is completely at ease with tonal harmony, there's absolutely no hope of getting even this far, let alone of arriving at a good final version. And now the completed exercise. I've composed a compound line around the harmony sketched above, using the motives from the original two bars. Notice that no matter how the dissonances arrive, they're always resolved by step. Pay special attention to the following aspects of the solution. As we said, the motives include appoggiaturas, accented passing tones, and accented neighbor notes, which considerably enrich the possibilities for the line, since the note on the beat doesn't always have to be a chord tone. There's also an implied suspension. The A-flat in the first half of measure 1 becomes a suspension in the second half of the bar. Look at the first half of measure 2 now, where the D-flat appoggiatura, followed by two accented passing tones, makes possible a conjunct line. All of these dissonances can be used in the solution with inappropriate motives. And of course, they all resolve by step. The upper line first stays in the same register as the opening, from measure 3 to 5, then dips down in measure 5 and 6. The only time both parts have 16th notes at the same time is at the climax in measure 9. This helps make it a more potent moment in the piece. The large leaps in measure 3, 6, and 9 would of course be out of the question vocal style, and in compound line for keyboard, they pose no special problems, provided that overall the registers are well organized and don't leave active notes unresolved. There's another, somewhat easier exercise of this type in the accompanying PDF. We already mentioned that in stratified counterpoint, contrasting instrumental timbres can make the layers clearer. Here's an example of Bach's organ chorale, Wachet auf, ruft uns die Stimme. Notice how each layer here has its own distinctive sound. The top line is motivically and rhythmically the most active. The bass is calmer but still quite mobile. The middle part is a Lutheran chorale, originally a vocal melody. With the differences in registration, the stratified texture is very clearly audible. There are numerous examples of stratified texture everywhere in Bach's instrumental music. The student should continue the stratified beginnings in the accompanying PDF, poaching them in the same way as the two-part counterpoint above. First sketch the harmony, then decide where the lines should go, and finally complete the remaining details. Since these examples are in more than two parts, they'll be somewhat easier than the keyboard example. Again, note that not every part is a separate layer. In fact, one often sees four parts arranged as just two layers, as in the organ example in the PDF. Remember, compound lines need to be logically organized with motives and careful control of register. Start with the harmony before working on the melody. Sing and play.